Sergeant asked me to talk about materials. It's quite a heavy subject. I don't want to dive into the, the joys of, of metallurgy, but more what it means to you in production. Things to think about when you're, as a supervisor, a manager, a foreman in production, what does the material mean to you? Here is a certificate for a bit of plate. Eh? Very good. So, plate certified. Here's a problem. Ship with a big, big old crack down the side comes into your dock for repair. You pick up the first bit of plate available and off you go. Eh? Welded up. Problem solved. Yeah? No? Ships are designed by some quite clever people who, who put in high tensile steels where it's needed and, and milder steels where it's needed. So, these areas here, you tend to find you'll get higher grade steels. Uh, ship sides is just mild ship plate, AH plate, stiffeners are all just secondary plate. So before you start repairing something, you need to know what you're filling with, what you're cutting out and what you're putting back in. Because the, because the grades of plate do change. Also, class has something to do with it as well. Uh, all class size are the same. But this is a degree of... Um, if you see structural importance as far as class is concerned. This being the most important, this being the, the least important, like secondary plate, uh, highly loaded elements. And as a designer come down with the thickness of plate, that governs what plate you're supposed to use. Yeah? So the designer's got a say, class has got a say on what plate is supposed to be on that ship. So, uh, back to my certificate, we're going to touch on, they talk about yield stress, tensile stress, what, what, what is that, what does it mean? I know, we've, basically, we've been here before this morning, but we take the plate, they, we put, a, put it in the machine and we pull it till it breaks. That's what we do. And that is pretty, it's not much more scientific than that. And that gives us our yield stress. As we, normal strength, high strength, extra high strength. So as we come down, the higher, higher the yield stress, the higher the greater plate. That, that's how we get there in the first place. So this is, this is DNV grades of plate. Uh, basically, the higher the number, for you, the harder it is to weld. That's the important thing for you. When you start getting... Three digit numbers, 500s, 690s, you are talking difficult plate to weld. When you're up here, this is, this is ship plate, this is A grade plate, it's much more forgiving. It, it, it will let you weld relatively easy. This stuff here is not forgiving at all. So when you're, and you'll only see this really on some big offshore projects. But, but when you see the big numbers, you need to be aware of that. This is something special going on. Then, the other thing on your certificate is the Sharpies. Sharpie impacts, which again, we've, we've been a little bit there. We take, we take a bit of plate, we put it in here, we, we twat it really, and the, uh, the energy it takes to break tells us the Sharpie impacts. And for that, it, it's basically measuring toughness, brittleness. Uh, and it tells you the quality of the plate. That's, that's really what it's, what it's telling you. This is one big Sharpie impact. This was a, a Liberty ship which came out of the States, I, th I think, in the, around the time of the war and basically went into the North Atlantic, had brittle fracture. So, when we do Sharpie impacts, we do them at different temperatures. So here's your, here's your mild steel, high tensile, extra high strength. We do them 0 to, six, to 40, uh, 0 to 60, 0 to 60. So you can have, you can have mild steel with uh, E grade, you can have high tensile with E grade, extra high with E grade, and so on. Yeah? That's how, how, we, uh, how the plate comes together. Once again, Further down the alphabet you get, the harder it is to weld. Yeah? When you get down to F grade, it's preheats essential, good quality controls essential, it's very difficult to weld. 
A-grade stuff, once again, is, is much more uh, forgiving for you. So, rec recognize the, the, if you're dealing with plate, recognize the grade of plate and recognize that if it's a EF plate, it means something special. As the plate comes together, we have our, we have our grade of plates, A, the, the Sharpies, the tensiles and so on, comes together. And I'm, I'm standing here on behalf of DNV. The other societies, Lloyd, GBS, GL, BV, NK, we're all pretty much the same. We're all, we're all in line with each other. A few subtle differences, which you need to be aware of, I suppose. The DNV doesn't talk about AH. So A36 to, to DNV is actually AH to ABS. A little bit different. It's, just, it's the same plate, but we, we don't use the H terminology. Same with uh, GL, don't use it either. Um, Another thing is ASTM A36 is not the same as NVA36. Very different. It's up here somewhere. It's a much uh, less, less quality greater plate. So just to, re to reiterate, the further you come down here, the harder it's going to be to weld. Once you're down in this area, you're talking difficult stuff. Yeah. So. In, in, the, in the yard, I mean, you, you, it's not a perfect world. Some, a ship comes in, it needs to repair. You guys have got to put, fix it up, send it back out. You go and get what you can get. Huh? That's suitable, which is fair enough. All class societies have got an opinion on that, uh, which I can't share everybody's opinion. But sometimes, sometimes to use other plate comes with some, uh, some issues. Um, so you probably have to go through a lot of recertification process. I know dry docks use tri-plate certificates so that it gets through everybody and so on. If you're, if you're building a DNV ship, we want DNV plate, really. And I think the other societies are probably much the same. Now, when something, when putting a better grade of steel is not acceptable, there's a, there's a number of case, yeah, there's a number of pitfalls, if you like, which came to, me, came to my mind. Um, you, for a, you can wear out weaker components. If you put on rubbing bars on a, on a mooring system and you put on a high quality plate, you'll wear out the chain. And that's not the objective. If, if, the, if the design calls for E36 and you put it in something much better, maybe it's uh, hard to weld. It's going to give you you're going to have to upgrade your welding consumable, which is going to cost you money. It's going to take you longer and better control to weld it. So it's, economically, it's not always that smart. You start getting up into the, the extra high strength steel, you're going to start have to doing preheat again, which is just an additional cost and time for yourselves. And if you really, if you really start putting in good stuff, you can get cracking problems if you don't use the right procedure. So you, you can, by going and getting the best stuff to fix the solution, create problems for yourself. Then on Sharpies, you sometimes see uh, Z, Z quality. Um, what is Z quality? Here's a plate comes out the mill in the longitudinal direction, transverse direction. Z is the th through thickness. Plate is made up in layers and the, and the Z quality is checking this through thickness. Yeah, that's, that's basically how you test it. You take your plate, you put it into your machine, and you, you pull it again. And that's, that's what Z quality is. This is not Z quality. This is a lamination problem. Yeah. Yeah, what, we've, we've done some dye pen just to show the example. Uh, that, that, that plate has, this was in another shipyard, but this plate has some serious problems. When, when do we use Z quality? I think, I think I'm right in saying in the Polarcas vessels, if anyone here is working on them, under the crane pedestal, that plate's Z quality. On the, um, the T Asia, T, T Africa, you put a big old riser mast. The plate at the bottom of that one's Z quality. 
uh, probably possibly in some of your FPSOs and the flare towers they do it. If you, if you imagine you put a crane pedestal on top of here and you have a problem in the steel, the crane, his load and the driver are going to go over the side at some point, which is no good for anybody. Yeah. So when you, when you see something like this, the foundations of it, maybe the designers call for Z quality. Now, a problem for dry docks and any yard for that matter is it's maybe only one plate in the whole ship that's got to have this grade. And you don't stock it. And it's very expensive to buy one plate with this special grade. So there's a number of UT options which always gets kicked around when you have to do that, which, which is OK. Then also in our certificate, we have a chemical composition. Basically, tells you what's in there. If you have any buyers in the house buying a stock, this is the, you, can't, you will not be able to read it from where you are, but this is um, sulfur. If you have a high sulfur on a certificate, you're buying recycled plate. You're, you're buying car for shopping trolleys, really, and turned into plate. Yeah. There's, a, there's a limit, a class is the limit how much sulfur should be there. That's it's just, just an indication. What do we use that for? Here's a minimum requirement for, for what goes into a plate. It's, it's, this is less for the, for the foreman and the, and the supervisor. This is more for the welding engineers. If they, if they take a plate and they, they punch in all this, it comes up with a, a thing called the uh, carbon equivalent, which basically tells you how difficult it is to weld. That's the main purpose of it. If you've got a material that you have never dealt with before, something really strange, and you're, having to, you're having to weld it, you can do this. You can do a carbon equivalent. And you can see what you've got. And you can, your welding and engineers can put something together for welding it. Or say, say an old jack-up comes across from Iran. And you have no drawings, no idea what the, what the legs are made out of, but you've got to do a weld repair on it. There's maybe one of these machines around, around the corner there. You, you do this positive material identification. You find out what it's made out of. You do this, this carbon equivalent, and you, you can get a good feeling how, you, how you're going to weld it up. So it's kind of, kind of detective work for your uh, welding engineers. And then the other thing is uh, the carbon equivalent throws up when uh, preheat's required. So the, the higher the carbon number, the thicker the plate, you're going to have to start doing preheat. That's, it's more, you'll see this just more in offshore projects rather than general ship projects. Harness, I don't, I don't know if it's, you, pr you probably have these machines, I guess, Kevin, yeah? We use harness in a number of ways to, again, mostly in the offshore side of things. On your FPSOs, you'll use them for, for tell you how, how, how hard a weld should be. This makes a specification. Or I've used them on, if you're welding up uh, mooring windlasses. Because you'd, again, you don't want that to be harder than the chain and destroy the chain. Yeah. So there's, a, there's some tools you can use to put in a quality job. Castings. Just uh, a few other things, just materials which you, which you guys deal with, which I'm just trying to throw up a few things that you should perhaps think about. Shipside valves. One of your ships is leaving this weekend. The ship side valve's got to be replaced. You go down to the store and get the first one you can get. Problem solved. Well, almost. If it's grey cast iron, it has no ductility. You hit that with a hammer, it falls into two pieces. And then uh, the chief engineer's day is ruined quite significantly. So you want, if you're fitting in casting, cast uh, ship side valves, nodular cast iron. This is a chain stopper on a, on a ship I was building in uh, Far East. They had to put on an adjustment plate. They just, it was again a few days before delivery, no, I, they had to adjust it. We turned up, this was uh, fully welded. We asked, started asking a few questions, what have you done? 
I've just taken some mild steel and welded it up. So we, we stripped the paint off and we found it was completely cracked, the whole thing. And the reason is they didn't know what they were welding to. It's a big old casting. They, they didn't know what they were dealing with and they just took the, what they had and they welded it up and it cracked. So if you're, if you're fooling with castings, know what you're dealing with. By nature, they're quite large. Eh? Say you've got a stern tube. By nature, that thing is quite large in volume. Yeah? You're coming down with your shell plate to it, and you will. So this is, this is maybe 20 millimeters. This one's maybe 70 millimeters. The cross surface area here is a whole lot bigger than here. So when you weld that up, all the heat runs here. All the heat just disappears into here. And you get rapid heat loss from the weld, and you get cracking problems. So when you're dealing with casting, mainly because one of the reasons is it's because they're so large, you need to do preheat to avoid the rapid cooling and the, the rapid loss of heat from your weld that you're trying to put in. On the, the Acker H6, which we delivered uh, a year or so ago in this year, from this yard, we had some very uh, say exotic castings. These were very special plates, which I had never, first time I dealt with them. Very high strength uh, grade of plate of, of casting. We weren't allowed to weld on them on the actual surface. You could only weld on the sides of them. And they were very special, a lot of preheat, a lot of care. When you're dealing with castings, know what's involved. Eh? That's the message here. Or ask. If you don't know, ask. Finally, the, um, this is a tail shaft of, a, of another ship that was built in the Far East. You want to focus on this, this corner here? It's a small uh, defect there. What happened? A welder took his, took his rod and made an made an arc strike in that shaft. And from that rapid cooling on a high tensile uh, shaft caused a micro fracture here. The ship left the shipyard and a few days later the chief engineer had the tail shaft in two pieces. So, the, I mean, obviously you need to, in the yard you need to take care of this, but don't also, don't fool with this uh, machinery. Don't start welding bits onto it. Because this is a very special plate, or very special steel. So that was really, really what all I was um, really want to bring to you for material and production. I've set a, li a little alarm bell. Have something should ring in your head, eh? If you're, if you, if if you're starting to weld some of this stuff up, these high numbers, a little bell should go off that this is not business as usual. This is. Today is something a bit more than normal. If you start dealing with plates with F, EF grades, again, it's more care, more respect is required to do a proper job. If you come across structure that's 50 millimeters thick, well, the designers made it that for a reason, and it's probably a high, ten, high tensile steel. It probably needs it's probably made out of some, some quality plate, and probably needs preheat or some care or some proper control. So check before you, uh, before you start welding it. Same with the castings. Know what you're dealing with castings. Your offshore projects, yeah, your, you need to, uh, when, these are typically when you see these big old structures on your, your, uh, uh, module foundation stools and such things, you'll come across some of this heavy plate. Know what it is and take care with it. And then this, uh, anytime you see a plate under a crane, under a mast, and perhaps it's a, uh, it should be special quality plate. Yeah. If in doubt, talk to a welding engineer. You've got some good guys, Nico and Zelko, excellent guys. Talk to them. Tell them your job, tell them what you want to do, and they'll help you out. Eh? Okay, that was, that was it. May I request uh, Ms. Morris to give the 
concluding words. Well, all of you, first of all, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed to the, uh, to the business partners, um, ladies and gentlemen. I'll just pick up Kevin there, refer reference to, uh, to gentlemen earlier on. Some ladies, for, for your assistance and, uh, and attendance today, thank you very much indeed for the, uh, for the support team over there, for the uh, excellent refreshments throughout the course of today. But um, importantly, on behalf of Drydocs World Group, I'd like to reassure you of our senior management commitment in terms of, uh, of quality, in terms of the uh, you know, quality and continual improvements that uh, we aim to see and, uh, and drive within the, uh, the organization, but also the positive commitment from the business partners here today and senior management, that is, uh, that is very good. And, uh, and again, thank you very much indeed. Secondly, we'd like to thank all the speakers for an excellent day. Sajan for, uh, for pulling it all together and, and getting such an excellent balance of very professional and experienced internal speakers and also uh, external speakers with such a, a broad range of experience, qualifications and, uh, and skills that we've been able to, to learn today. I hope that you know, business partners will and you know, subcontractors will take away everything that's been said today because ultimately your success is our success and, 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 and vice versa. We need to work together as a team and that team you know, does depend very much on, on all of us working together in order to achieve the customer success and then ultimately the, uh, the financial success and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and our, our business expectations. On a final point, just before I finish, I just like to take these, these two posters here. Quality never stops, it just gets better and better. And this main poster here, doing it right first time is our goal, process control is the key. And a very valid point that, uh, that Kevin Dalton raised in his presentation, that you can't have a quality management system without KPOs, without those key performance or process objectives. You can't have key process objectives without a management program that sets out how you're going to achieve those key performance uh, or key process objectives. And on a final point, I'm sure all of you in this room have heard of the world's greatest artist, Michelangelo, and his quality paintings, especially uh, his quality masterpiece on the, uh, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Now, he himself said that a very valid point when it comes to, uh, to quality, quality improvements and objectives, that failure isn't about the inability to achieve stretched goals, stretched objectives. Failure is the ability to achieve weak objectives. And as Kevin said there earlier on, your inspections, look at your inspections. Put that down as a key performance, uh, key process objective and double it. Stretch your objectives because you cannot have a quality management system without those objectives and success will come from robust and stretched objectives and we as Tridox Well can help you achieve that and help you put that in place. So therefore, when you leave this room, please do not hesitate to, to get in touch with us. Sajan and his team are here to, uh, to do that. And again, big thank you from, uh, from the group to all of you and Sajan and his team. Thank you.